Hello, I'm Professor Sims, and in this video I will discuss selective and differential media. This is the sixth in a series of 10 lab sessions held as part of my online Laboratory for the Fundamentals of Microbiology course. If you are a student currently enrolled in this course, please consult the syllabus and course Moodle site for assignments, quizzes, due dates, and other course information. The learning objectives for this unit include learning about the properties of and uses for selective and differential media, observing the appearance of bacteria and yeast grown on several different types of selective and differential media, and interpreting characteristics of the specimen based on their growth and color. Also, please be sure to observe the proper safety and disposal procedures for this lab. As we have discussed before, microorganisms need a constant nutrient supply to survive. You are already familiar with the physical types of media. Today we will begin to discuss different biochemical types of media. Microbes have specific pH, temperature, and oxygen requirements. We have discussed this topic previously, and it may be helpful for you to review the microbial requirements for growth prior to performing the Lab 6 procedures. This information can be found in the Lab 2 video and reading assignment. The first type of media we will discuss is general growth media. General growth media is neither selective nor differential. Pretty much anything that will grow in a lab will grow on general growth media. General growth media we commonly use in lab are your nutrient agar, tryptic soy broth and tryptic soy agar. For lab 6, nutrient agar will be used to isolate a specimen prior to testing it using selective and differential media. General growth media is also useful as a positive control when you're trying to interpret your SD media test results. So you can look and see if you're looking for good growth on a selective or differential media and you're not sure, you can't really tell if it's quote unquote good growth, then you should compare it to how that same specimen grows on nutrient agar and see if it grows as well as it does on nutrient agar or maybe better, maybe not so good. And that way the nutrient agar acts as a positive control. Another common type of media is enriched media or enrichment media. This type of media is useful when the organism you wish to culture is present in relatively small numbers or it may be present in a mixed culture. For example, if we want to isolate bacteria that break down crude oil called hydrocarbonoclastic bacteria, sequential subculturing in a medium that supplies carbon only in the form of crude oil will enrich the cultures with oil-eating bacteria and any unwanted bacteria would eventually die off in the process. Selective media actively inhibits the growth of unwanted microorganisms and supports the growth of the organism of interest by supplying nutrients and by reducing competition. Selective agents include things like high salt, high or low pH, um, and that's just to name a few. There's other things like dyes and stuff like that. The next three media we will talk about, the PDA, SDA, and PEA are all selective. In total, there are six types of media in this lab session that are classified as selective. So in addition to PDA, SDA, and PEA, we also have EMB, McGonkey, and MSA. But EMB, McGonkey, and MSA agar are not just selective, they're also differential. So we'll talk about that some more in just a moment. But let's first talk about the PDA. PDA stands for potato dextrose agar. PDA is selective for yeasts, molds, and fungi. It has a low pH, so it's acidic, and that low pH discourages the growth of most, but not all, bacteria. Some bacteria do okay in low pH, but most are not going to do so well unless the pH is closer to neutral, like between 6 and 8. This medium is often used to identify microbial contamination in food and clinical specimen. Sabaron dextrose agar, SDA, is really similar to PDA in that it has an acidic pH that inhibits bacterial growth. SDA is primarily used for the selective cultivation of yeast mold and fungi, certain pathogenic fungi specifically. It's often used to identify microbial contamination in food and cosmetics. So in a lot of ways, it's very, very similar to PDA. Um, what grows better on PDA versus SDA sometimes is 
comes down to what species, what particular species you are looking at. But in general, yeast molds and fungi will grow much better on SDA or PDA than bacteria will. PEA, phenylethyl alcohol agar, is a selective media that encourages the growth of gram-positive organisms and inhibits the growth of most gram-negative organisms. So PEA is selective for gram-positive bacteria, but also some yeasts will grow well on PEA because they are gram-positive as well. PEA is not a differential medium because it does not distinguish between different organisms per se. It merely encourages or discourages growth. Phenyl ethyl alcohol is the selective agent that inhibits gram-negative organisms by breaking down their membrane permeability barrier and by inhibiting their DNA synthesis. So here is an example of a PEA plate that has four species growing on it. When you interpret this growth, you would first want to look to see if they have, quote, good growth. Sometimes it's much easier to tell that there is not very good growth. Sometimes you might have to compare how it looks on the selective media versus how it looks on general growth media. So it looks like Staph aureus and Staph epidermidis have pretty good growth. E. coli is a bit more questionable. So if you have something like this, it's kind of semi-transparent, you're not sure if that is considered good growth or not, then you would want to look at E. coli on nutrient agar. And obviously, since you're at an at-home lab, you're not going to have E. coli growing on nutrient agar. It's completely okay to just Google image search and see what it should look like. But I would be suspect of this growth here, especially because we know that E. coli is a gram-negative species. The differential media make it easy to distinguish colonies of different bacteria, either by a change in the color of the colonies themselves or the color of the medium it will change instead. Color changes are, an, are a result of end products that are created by an interaction of bacterial enzymes with differential substrates in the medium or, in the case of hemolytic reactions, the lysis of red blood cells in the media. Selective and differential media can be combined and they can play an important role in the identification of bacteria by biochemical methods. Note that the following three types of media that we're going to be talking about are both selective and differential. And also note that we will use other types of differential media in future labs, which will be non-selective but differential only. So a media can be selective only, it can be differential only, or it can be both selective and differential, like these next three are. EMB, eosine methylene blue agar, is selective for gram-negative bacteria. It contains dyes, eosine and methylene blue dyes, which are toxic to gram-positive bacteria. EMB is also differential. It's differential for lactose fermentation. Lactose fermenters will stain with the methylene blue eosinate dye to a dark purple or a metallic green color. This figure up top shows EMB inoculated with two coliforms, a gram-negative non-coliform and a gram-positive organism. Note the metallic green color here and the dark purple color here. These two are fermenters of lactose. They can ferment the lactose that's in the media. Also note it is possible for a gram-positive species to grow on EMB. It's just that, like we've seen before, it isn't necessarily growing as well on EMB as it would on general growth media. So sometimes you really do need to compare what you're looking at on SD media to what it would look like on general growth media. So you would say that this specimen is most likely gram-negative and it ferments lactose. That's how you would interpret that. You have good growth here and it's dark purple, so you would say this specimen is most likely gram-negative and it ferments lactose. Here you have good growth, but it has not changed color to the green or purple that you would expect for fermentation. So you would say this specimen is most likely a gram-negative species that does not ferment lactose. And then here you would say that this specimen is most likely gram-positive because it is showing growth, but if you compared it to how it looks on nutrient agar, because it is not showing good growth, would be most likely gram-positive and not a fermenter of lactose. On this plate here, you have a species on the left and a species on the right. Both of these are showing good growth, so you could say that both of them are most likely gram-negative species. For this one on the left, we are seeing the color change happening, so you would say that this species most likely does ferment lactose, and this one does not. 
Magonkey is selective for gram-negative bacteria. It contains bile salt and crystal violet, which interfere with the growth of many gram-positive bacteria, and it favors the growth of gram-negatives, particularly Enterobacteraceae. In general, gram-negative organisms grow well, and most gram-positive organisms do not. Uh, Magonkey is also differential. Lactose fermenters will appear pink or brick red, whereas non-lactose fermenters will appear either off-white or colorless. Sometimes they kind of take up the color of the agar, like here you've got kind of a light pink. And the indicator dye used in the Magonkey is the neutral red. In this first figure here, you can see uh, Magonkey agar was inoculated with four different species of Enterobacteraceae. So these are all gram-negative bacteria. They're all four showing good growth. So if you're interpreting this plate, you would say for each one of these species, it's most likely gram negative. And then for these two here, you could also say that they most likely ferment lactose, and these two do not. The same down here, you've got good growth on both sides. So you'd say this species is most likely gram negative and does ferment lactose, and this one is most likely gram negative and does not ferment lactose. And finally, you have MSA, mannitol salt agar. Mannitol salt agar is selective for gram-positive bacteria, but not just gram-positive bacteria, gram-positive cocci. It also has a high salt content, which inhibits the growth of some organisms. So MSA is going to be your most selective media because it selects not only for bacteria, not only for gram-positive bacteria, but specifically cocci and also halo-tolerant cocci. MSA is routinely used to, to help identify staphylococci and micrococci, and it's also differential for mannitol fermentation. So fermentation of the carbohydrate mannitol decreases the pH below 6, 6.8, and then changes the color of the media from a reddish, pinkish color to more of a bright yellow. So you may have the bacteria itself turn yellow, but more often than not, you have the media around it also turn yellow. So it's usually really easy to read an MSA plate that's positive. For experiment one, you're going to be watching this video here. And in the video, there's there are several images of organisms that have been inoculated and incubated on selective or differential media. And your job is going to be in, to interpret the results. Be sure to note the plate number, the type of media, whether the specimen showed good growth, whether or not it showed color change, if it is a differential media. And you're going to use those observations to answer the questions in your report template. And again, there are three, three steps to interpreting selective and differential media. For your observations, you're going to answer first, is there good growth? If you're not sure if the growth is considered good, then you want to seek out an image that would represent how it looks on nutrient agar or triptych soy agar and compare the two. If there is good growth, then the microbe tolerates the selective agent. And then depending on what the selective agent is in that media, what kind of media it is, good growth on that media is generally going to tell you if it is a yeast or a bacteria and if it is gram positive or gram negative. Then if you are looking at something growing on a media that is differential, you would also answer question number two, is there a color change? So for EMB, you're looking for a color change that went from, you know, colorless or off-white to a shiny green, metallic green color, or a dark purple. On McGonkey, you're looking for bacteria that is hot pink or brick red. And on MSA, you're looking for the media being a bright yellow. If you see those, then that means that that bacteria is fermenting whichever sugar is in the media, be it lactose or mannitol. So the third part here is what you're going to end up putting in your report. You will say the microbe is most likely, right? So if you have good growth, again, if you have good growth on McGonkey and it's not showing the color change, you would say the microbe is most likely a gram-negative bacteria that does not ferment lactose. Next, you're going to get to do some fun stuff at home. Uh, for experiment two, you're going to prepare one nutrient agar plate, and you're going to use this plate to first isolate 
a specimen from a mixed culture, and then you're going to take isolated colonies from the nutrient agar plate and put them onto selective and differential media in order to test, is it gram positive? Is it gram negative? Does it ferment a sugar? Is it even bacteria? Maybe it's something else. Maybe it is a mold or fungus. Okay. So you prepare one nutrient agar plate. You will inoculate that plate using a sterile swab, but you're trying to isolate. You're trying to isolate the species. So you're only going to swab in the first quadrant. Okay. And then you're like, wait, but what am I inoculating it with? Well, you're going to be swabbing your nostrils. You're going to see what's living in your nose. So you take a sterile swab and you don't need to moisten it. You're just going to gently swab inside of your nostrils and then you're going to take that swab and inoculate the first quadrant of your nutrient agar plate and then throw that swab away. Then you're going to use the disposable sterile loops to prepare a streak plate, streaking for isolation. Remember we did this in lab two. And hopefully you'll have some isolated colonies in three or four, in quadrants three or four. That plate is going to have to incubate for 24 hours. And then after it's incubated for 24 hours, you're going to have a look at that plate. And hopefully you will have at least two different colony morphologies that you see on the plate. You may have many more. Uh, I wouldn't go more than maybe six for the next step, okay? So it's between two and six is what we're shooting for. And you'll have a MSA plate and a McGonkey plate in your kit. And however many different colony types, different morphologies you see here that are isolated that you want to test, that's how many different ways you would divide up your plate. So maybe you only have two. You just divide it in half and inoculate one on one side and one on the other. Maybe you have four and you would divide it into four. Maybe you have five and you could divide it into five. However many you have, however many you want to test, it needs to be at least two though. You would divide the plate up and then do your little simple streaks just within the quadrant that is de designated for each individual colony type. And then that has to incubate for another 24 hours before you can interpret the results. So again, it's the same as you did before. The interpretation is going to be, do you have good growth? And was there a color change? And what does that mean? Now I want to caution y'all when you're doing the nasal swabs that you are not doing a nasopharyngeal swab, okay? We're not doing this. You are only swabbing just the very insides of your nostrils, okay? Just gently swab the inside of your nostrils. And also, please do not try to skip the isolation step because if you are using selective and differential media to test your species to see if, if they're gram positive or negative, if they ferment sugar or not, you're not going to get any information from that test if you haven't already isolated your specimen. Because if you're not working with a pure culture, then I mean, it's just going to all mush together and maybe some of the stuff in there does and maybe some doesn't. And you're just going to be looking at a collage of information and it's not going to tell you anything. So finally, beyond, you know, making sure that you are very careful when you're doing the nasal swab, you're going to follow very similar safety guidelines to what we've seen before. You want to make sure you keep all of the specimen away from food. You're disinfecting counters before and after doing the procedures. You're washing your hands before and after. If you have PPE, you're wearing that. Make sure you carefully read the procedures that I've given y'all. Decontaminate all the plates before you dispose of them and treat all of your specimen as potential pathogens. This table here I have provided, and it is in the Moodle site as well, it's, it's part of the slides. It is a very good idea to complete this table, especially before doing the lab report, but maybe even before trying to interpret either the plates in the video or the plates that you prepare, because this can be kind of a lot of information to keep up with. So what you do here, you have the different kinds of media. You have nutrient agar, potato dextrose agar, sabron dextrose agar, phenyl ethyl alcohol, you see methylene blue, McGonkey, and mannitol salt agar. And you can designate which ones are selective, which ones are differential. If they are selective, what do they select for? What is the selective agent? What's in the media that inhibits unwanted growth? What does it differentiate for? What's in the media that helps you to observe that difference? And that's going to help you with not only interpreting your data, the results of your growth, but also it's going to help you 
in the future, if you um, make tables like this for the media we'll be using in labs seven and eight, you'll see lab seven and eight uses lots of different types of media and they tell you lots of different kinds of things. Uh, so this is really just kind of the beginning of a swath of biochemical testing that you'll be learning about. Thank you guys for watching. Don't forget to do the reading. Check the description for more videos related to these topics and leave your questions for me in the comments below.